Our interview subject today has been recognized for over 40 years as one of the truly great rock vocalists of all time. Even as a teenager, he was being touted by his peers as their own favorite singer, and his career from free through Brad Company, The Firm, his solo work, and even a guest stint with Queen on tour a few years back, have only enhanced that belief. Just before we turn him over, though, to his interviewer, could we all take a moment to please stand and welcome him to our country as an official Canadian citizen. <laughs> We're all very proud to have you among us, Paul. To interview him, one of Canadian Radio's great question masters and a man as knowledgeable about music as any in the country. Please welcome interviewer Jeff Woods. Thank you, Greg. And now, please welcome the exceptional artist, Paul Rogers. so much. Thank you very much. You're probably wondering about the hockey stick. Um, of course, new citizens have to carry this around for a year. <laughs> Don't they? <laughs> After you. <laughs> Here you go, sir. Oh, thanks, man. You want to trade? So I'll put this... Oh, yeah. You, do you want to take that? You want to take that home? Uh, yeah. You actually, I will take that you home. You do need it. Thank you. You are in Canada now. All right. I've got to learn to skate first, though, I think. These are so, pretty swanky couches. I sit here. Do you want to be here? Sure. All right. <laughs> I'm glad you're here. We're all glad you're here. Great. Thank you. It's fantastic. I, um, it's a great honor. I'm, and I'm really, I'm really very, very pleased and honored to be accepted as a citizen. It's very nice. It's not like you just got to Canada. You've been coming here for many, many years, not just touring, but actually residing to the West. Well, it's true. I've lived here for some 15 years now in BC, and, um, I, you know, I, I got married here. I married a Canadian lady, Cynthia, my darling wife. Where are you? She's out there somewhere. And, um, you know, after, after 15 years, I thought, well, you know, it's about time I sort of, you know, took the final step. So we did that, and it's good. A lot of the people in the room probably haven't been through the process. What is it like to actually go through that? What do you have to do to become a Canadian citizen? Well, well I, you know, they made it very easy for me, actually, down at, um, at Surrey. They, uh, there's a few forms to fill in, and we went through the routine. And, and uh, we went down, and there was uh, a good 200 people from all walks of life. It was quite amazing. There was people from Afghanistan, from Iran, Iraq, uh, Jamaica. There was a Scottish guy there. There was. It was. Uh, it was amazing, actually, the cross section of people. And um, we all sang the national anthem. And they had me get up and sing the national anthem uh, at very short notice. I mean, I don't know if you if you know the national anthem very. Uh, most people they can get a, through the first couple of verses and then and then they mumble off. So it's quite. <laughs> It was a sudden thing, but it was okay. Were there whispers in the room? Did people recognize you? Did they know who you a were? A couple of people did, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. So you nice. led them in a rousing rendition. Uh, I did, yeah, I did. In fact, uh, uh, the mic actually blew up. So I started singing and it went... Poosh. For real? It did. And <laughs> I hadn't realized because everyone was singing away furiously. And, uh, and the guy came up to me and said, can you use this mic here? So there was a mic right stuck on the table, so I, I used that one. Not everything works so well in the Canadian government system, wow. apparently. It was great. <laughs> Paul, is, is it true what Jim Morrison said, that the West is the best, since you're living out West? How do you feel about West versus East? Oh, I like it all. I'm not going to get into that, <laughs> that thing, really. Because, you know, I, I, I live out in BC, and I find it, it's just beautiful all over Canada. I'd like to travel a lot more than I have done already because I've basically sort of lived here and, um, and, and, and gone touring, basically. I've been, got to Japan, I've got to Europe, and, um, and come back home. And what I like about where I live in, uh, in the Okanagan there is that it's very quiet and peaceful when I come back off the, off the road. I like that. A lot of stoplights in your town, I understand. 
There's no stoplights in, this, in the, in <laughs> the little one. town that I live in. No, it's just a hardware store and a, that's it. Obviously, Paul's going to perform for us in, in a little bit, including, yeah, fantastic, ah, including one good. song, back to the first album, the 1974 self-titled debut from the wonderful Bad Company. I want to commend you. It, it strikes me as um, um, a real pleasure for all of us to be able to hear your music this many years later. What you've got, I don't have a better expression for it, but it's the cool gene in that, in that I'm not going to disparage anyone by comparing you to specific people, but sometimes later in a man's or woman's career, there doesn't seem to be as much of that cool gene that gets cabaret-ish. It gets, it can be, it sounds satirical or self I can do cabaret. Well, that's... I left <laughs> my heart. No, no, I, I, thank you. I appreciate that. But I think it, uh, the people I listen to I think were very cool. You know, people like John Lee Hooker, Otis Redding, you know, Wilson Pickett and James Brown. And those people were, well, they were the epitome of cool. When I, when I heard them singing and performing, I just, like, the hairs on my arms just went up, you know. And I, I, the way they made me feel is I said, that's what I want to do. I want to try and do that. And I've been trying ever since, you know. The earliest memories of, 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 of singing in the house, was it in front of the mirror? When, when, it, when did this voice come to you? When did you realize, I've got this voice, I need to share it? Were you a kid? No, I didn't used to sing in front of the mirror. I can't recall ever doing that. But I, uh, you know, I sort of discovered I could sing when I was about 12 or so. Um, I, I got very interested in music. You know, the Beatles came out, there was, then there was the Stones, and I dug a little deeper, and, and I discovered blues and soul and all of that. And I, uh, I, there was a band of older boys, you know, they, they were probably about 17 or 18. To me, they were kind of really grown up, you know. And they let me go up to the mic and sing one day. And I, I sort of went up to the mic, and I sort of went, Good God, I miss Molly! Like that, and they went, oh! And I sort of, I could see that they thought that was kind of okay. And, uh, and I thought from then, okay, I, I think maybe I'll be a singer, you know, I know, something like that. Sorry about the shouting. The, the song I was sort of referring to uh, about the cool gene very, being very present and prevalent still in your career was uh, the track you did back in December. I released it as a CD single. It's getting airplay on the radio in North America. It's doing quite well. Tell us a bit about that song. Well, I, <clears throat> I've been writing songs um, with various people, actually, but um, I, I, this particular song I wrote with a chap called Perry Mergeloff, who has a studio in, over there in New York, and it's all analog. Um, and he sent me this track, and I thought, wow, this, this is such a great sound. There's something about the sound I really like. And I called him and said, what is the deal with the sound? And he said, well, it was all recorded analog you know, tape machines and valves and the old way of doing things. And that gave it a certain warmth, you know, like we had in the 70s. Digital is great. You know, it's very convenient and everyone goes for that. It's great for DJs. You can, you can play records a lot easier and uh, more efficiently. But I do love vinyl. I love the sound, of that old sound of tape and all of that. And so I like this track and um, I worked on it. We went backwards and forwards. Um, sending it, he lives in New York and I'm in, in BC, so we were sending things backwards and forwards, and we ended up with this really nice track. Um, and we said, okay, great, let's, what are we going to do with it, you know? So we said, well, we'll we both support uh, charities. His is a, a horse sanctuary in New York called Seraphin, and mine is a, um, a, horse, a racehorse sanctuary in England. Um, and we said, well, let's just put it out there because you can do that nowadays and, um, and put all the proceeds to the charities. Basically, that's what we've done. Tell us about this charity. I mean, you're a, you're, you have a house full of animals, cats and dogs, and you have an affinity, obviously, for horses yeah. because what happens to racehorses at the end of their career? Well, um, Deborah Bonham, who's John Bonham's um, sister, she introduced my wife to this horse sanctuary. And what they do in England, they... They rescue these racehorses. At the end of their career, very often, they are slaughtered. People think that they um, live a, a nice, you know, life in the meadow and, and it's all very lovely, but it's not. Just, very often they're slaughtered. And so my wife, Cynthia, got involved with the sanctuary. She went down there and she said to me, you have to come and see these horses, you know. So eventually I went down there and I just couldn't believe that they would consider shooting these 
fantastic creatures. They're such a fantastic spirit. They're enormous, you know, they're huge horses and they, they just look down at you and they've got this amazing spirit. And you think, wow, how could anyone just shoot this because it's, it's too expensive to keep? And that's what Graham and Sue, the people that run the sanctuary, that's how they feel and they, they feel so strongly about it that they, at one point they were so low with finances that they were sleeping in the stable for six months with the horses. So I, Cynthia and I, we said, well, we've got it. we can do something here, so let's do what we can. And we helped them find a new um, farm. It's a 40-acre place down there, so they've, they've recited. And, um, and we've, we did a show there for them and raised some funds. So we're doing what we can, and, and then we've got the record out as well. So it's just a little thing that we're doing that we feel good about doing, you know. And the track is called With Our Love. Yeah. So if you support that track, I think you're going to like it. It's really cool. Trust me, have a listen to it, and you'll be supporting a great cause and hearing a great tune. Another track you've done fairly recently, and another cause that's uh, you know, commendable, Amnesty International, uh, the Dylan track, Abandoned yeah. Love. Did you pick the track, or did you have choice in the matter? Uh, yes, they sent us a, a, a list of, of songs. My first choice would have been um, Mr. Tambourine Man or something like that, but I thought... well. I, that could be a little bit typical. So let's, let's find something that's really obscure. And we found this track called Abandoned Love, which had been recorded by George Harrison and I think the Everly Brothers. Yes, the Everly Brothers did a version of it too. So it hasn't been really overdone. And I called up a good friend of mine, Nils Lofgren, who's a big Bob Dylan fan. And I asked him if he would you know, help me with the track. And it's, it wasn't the easiest of tracks because Bob Dylan writes lyrics, it's poetry really, it's almost, sometimes it's not a song, it's just reams of, of lyrics, you know. And so you had to create a, a musical bed for it that built, you know, throughout the song. And, and that's, that was the challenge with doing that. And uh, Nils was great, there was so much colour that he put into it, you know, um, musically. And we, that's what we did, we did that, it was great. The track, again, is, is wonderful, and it has that cool gene. Um, maybe That's on the right. poster you saw um, neighborhood of um, 30 albums since 1968, closing in on something like 90 million-plus records sold around the world. Uh, beyond the numbers, Paul, how do you measure success in your career? Oh, that's a good question. I... I have been successful with quite a few bands, you know, with Free, with Bad Company, with The Firm, you know, even with Queen. I, I measure success, I think, by how happy I am and how free I feel every day. And I do find when, you know, this is just me, though. I mean, I don't, not everybody else feels the same way, of course, but I found it very restrictive to be in a band with a name where everyone has got equal say in what you do. It, it, you're, it's fine as long... It's like a, a chariot. Uh, come back to horses. If, as long as the horses are all pulling in the same direction, it works really well. But when they start pulling off in different directions, that's where life gets a little complicated, and that's how it's been for me. So I found that, ultimately, the best thing that I can do was to create a, a solo band in which... You know, I mean, basically, I call the shots. I mean, I hate to say that. It sounds a little egotistical, but that's the kind of deal when the guys come in, they understand that's what we'll be doing, and we'll be... I, I, I pick uh, songs I've written from Free, from Bad Company, The Firm, and, and new songs, and, and I can paint a, a broader palette, um, and it really works well for me, you know. So that's, that's currently what I'm doing. <clears throat> People are probably thinking, what's a good example of what you just talked about? Honestly, what? what's a good example of what you just talked about? How people are pulling in a different direction among your previous bands? Is there is there something that broke the camel's back in one of those scenarios because of that? Well, you know, I mean, if I go back all the way, really, to Free, um, that, I I miss that band. You know, we had such a great band together. But I, when I look back, we were very young. We were kind of under the radar as far as commerciality was concerned, and we were managing ourselves, and we were playing blues, and we started to write songs, and all of a sudden we had this monster hit, and I don't think we were ready for it at all, you know. Um, I wanted at one point to go back to the blues, because I, or at least, you know, inter reintroduce more of the blues back into the set. Nobody else wanted to do it, so we kind of, we went, we were pulling in different directions musically. But it was a good band, you know, and it's still 
stood the test of time, I think. I woke up singing uh, Fire and Water, you know, in the shower. It wasn't very good, but the song's great. Oh, I'm sure it was great. <laughs> um, the revival of 60s American um, uh, blues in the 60s of American blues from the, the Mississippi Delta from decades before that in England was so prevalent and it launched so many careers, obviously yours and, and, and Clapton's and Beck's and all the guys that were fans of Alexis Corner and, and, and John Mayle helped that launch pad. What was it about that American blues from the Mississippi Delta that it was so attractive to teenagers in, in England? It's a good question and I, I really am not sure about the answer. I can give all kinds of hypotheses and I can guess. Uh, I mean, I'm, myself, I'm from a working class town in the northeast of England, which is, was uh, shipbuilding and steelworking and chemical industries. And I, when I heard the blues, I heard something very exotic and, and they were singing about you know, places a long way away and jumping on trains and disappearing for thousands of miles. And it was, uh, it was a kind of freedom that you couldn't even conceive of in the northeast of England. And I think that partly, was, the theme of it, was that, that was part of the attraction. But just the music itself, you know, the 12-bar blues and the way that on a 12-bar blues, there's, there's possibly millions of 12-bar blues written and that structure is still uh, good enough to where you can write another million songs on the 12 bar blues. It's that versatile. I mean, I'd like to know uh, a song structure on which another song structure other than the 12 bar blues that you can do that on. It's quite incredible. So it's amazingly versatile. Beyond the, you know, the classic polka, beyond that, it, no kidding. <laughs> um, I want to thank you, Paul, for contributing to, um, to my Beatles show. I have a series called The Complete Beatles, and you may not be aware. Somebody asked you, what are your favorite Beatles songs? And I was thrilled that you picked not only one from the early days, but a more psychedelic one. You picked She Loves You, and you picked I Am the Walrus. Oh, yeah. And, and I yeah. wanted to know more about your affinity for the Beatles and how profoundly they affected you when you were young. Well, you know, the Beatles were a fantastic influence for me because if you look at England, the bit, Liverpool is there and Middlesbrough is just across, across the country on the East Coast, you know. So when I looked at them and I saw their success and their happiness, I mean, they were so... Um, you saw them doing interviews and they're so... They had this great repartee between them, you know. Um, and they made such amazing music and they seemed to be so free, you know. Um, I thought... Well, if, if they can do it, maybe I could, you know. Um, and really, that was about, that was all it took. I just, I loved what they did. Yeah. And you had that in mind when you did Shooting Star, obviously. Johnny was a schoolboy, he was... Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah I, I included the, the Beatles in that lyric. Um, but that, the song, it's, well, Shooting Star, by that time, you know, I was a, a songwriter. I, I had discovered songwriting when I was 17. And I discovered it was a great means of expressing some of my inner, you know, the anger that I felt. I was a very angry young person, you know, like a lot of people are. And uh, on stage, I found that I could get that out of my system, you know, and writing songs was part of that. With Shooting Star, it was, it was a case of, you know, looking around and seeing um, so many people were not making it. You know, you Jimi Hendrix and, and just Janis Joplin and all these great people who by right were very young and they were dying. And I was thinking, wow, this is the entertainment business. It's not a war zone. Why are so many people dying? So that's, that was really the birth of, of the idea for Shooting Star. You know, there's kind of a, a warning in a way. Young people, you know, Janice and Jim and Jimmy, all 27, but even younger than that, your own guitarist in Free. Paul was 25. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I still miss... We called him Koss, you know, Paul Kossoff. His nickname was Koss. And, um, yeah, we spent a lot of time on the road together. You know, he used to drive, and I used to, I used to be the co-pilot. I'd sit right next to him and keep him awake, you know. And, uh, yeah, yeah, I miss him quite a, quite a lot. And I think he was a casualty, really, of, of the band splitting up, you know. I didn't realize he would just kind of go down that fast. He, that's the trouble, you know, with... with with drugs, really, I guess, you know, the, heavy, the heavier drugs, man, is that they do destroy your mind. You know, you get, a, you get a great lift for a moment or two, but 
ultimately they are not really the great promise. They don't deliver on the promise at all, you know, in terms of... We used to think in those days, you know, if you take this, you'll be really creative and you'll be really amazing and like, you'll be like Jimi Hendrix. Well, not really, you know, I mean, it, it, the passion for music comes from within. It's not, it's not, it can't be falsely created by any other outside source. It comes from inside, you know, so... And that's the lesson. Were the times when you nearly went down that dark path yourself, though? Well, it was all around me, you see. So it was kind of almost normal. It was almost normal to just take whatever was there. And there was, there was a lot of cocaine. There was a lot of drugs around. And I, yeah, sure, you know, like everybody else. But I did draw the line at one point. And in fact, you know, I mean, I can tell a secret in a way. That's probably what split bad company in myself. I stopped all that, you know, and all of a sudden I felt like I was the outsider of, of the band. And, and it was a strange feeling, you know, I used to say, hey, come on, you guys, I know what's going on. You don't have to hide all this crap from me. I know what's, just do your thing. I'm not, I'm not criticizing, I'm not judging. But I think that's one of the things about that stuff is that it can make people a little paranoid too about people that aren't doing it, you know? So you're like, oh, you're like the policeman or something. It's like, well, so that, that's one of the reasons I think that, you know, that we ended up part in company, really. Um, Randy, you toured with, uh, with Buckman Turner. Yeah. And, and Randy had a rule because he'd been in the guest zoo and, and he didn't want to be around that element anymore. So in yeah. BTO, there was a rule. We don't do this. We, we were, mu we're musicians. This is yeah. a business. And, and, and invariably, they ended up making a lot of money and making a wonderful career out of it. Have you and he had discussions about any of this stuff? Not on, not actually, no, but, but I mean, I do, I totally agree with that. And Fred's a great guy, too. I love he's, Fred. He's a sweetheart, isn't he? Yeah, yeah, yeah. They're fantastic guys and uh, great musicians, too. But I think that it's true that, that um, music is about expressing yourself, you know. And, you know, I, I think now if Jimi Hendrix, for instance, it still, was still alive today and had been allowed to mellow like Ray Charles or, you know, or, uh, you know, uh, Miles Davis, or so, like that, he would have, we would have had so much more amazing music from him, I think. Hmm. Rolling Stone Magazine's list of the, of the greatest singers of all time, they do pretty good lists, as lists go. It has you three slots ahead of Christina Aguilera, four ahead of Rod Stewart. Christina's a good singer, like her. And Rod Stewart, I've got to say, I, gotta, I love Rod Stewart. <laughs> when I heard uh, him with Jeff Beck, and they had a record, it was... Uh, Truth? I think it was the B side of. Oh, it's a single. Of um, what's that record? High Horse Silver Lining. I think it was on the B side of that, and it was called Rock My Plimsoll. Brilliant. Which is a really weird title. <laughs> uh, I think I don't know why they called it that. It's, it's, it was basically that old blues thing, Rock Me Baby, you know. But when that combination of voice and guitar, and uh, I, it was. Um, Oh, and the bass player was Ronnie Wood. Ronnie was playing bass, yeah. Ronnie Wood, yeah. Wow. And it was... It, doom, 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 doom. it was, you can't rock me. It was just amazing. And when I heard that, I thought, that's, that's it. That's what you got to do. Rod doesn't sing like that too much anymore. He does other things, and that's fine. You know, it, he does what he wants to do, but that was fantastic. Rod and, and, and Robert Plant and so many vocalists and so many people that aren't even you know, world-class entertainers, we all tend to lose a bit of our range. Um, less so with you, evidently. What do you attribute that to? Well, you know, people do ask me that. And I've been thinking about it. And I, and I don't think about uh, what my range is. I don't think about it. You know, it's not about what my range is. Am I keeping my range? It's about do I feel this? If I can feel it, I can hit those notes. Do you know what I mean? And, I, and, and, I, and I'm careful about... Um, I hear some, some singers, and they're good singers, and they're warming up, but they're warming up too hard. You know, that, one of the things that I would avoid doing... Supposing you had a you know, Maserati or a Lamborghini, and it I was wish. cold. Yeah, you wish. We all wish. <laughs> and, and it was cold. You wouldn't start the engine and hit the gas to warm it up, would you? And that's the same with your voice. You want to warm it up gently, you know, mm -hmm, just like, just humming and things like that, so that you build up, so that by the time you, you want to be full on, you're fully warmed up. That's what I would say. I suspect there's people in the room that are here because they are singers or would aspire to be singers. Do you have anything beyond the warm-up idea in terms of tips for someone who wants to make a living 
being a vocalist. Don't do it. Don't do it. <laughs> yeah. uh, um, you know, I, 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 I'm really not an expert. I, you know, I've lived the business, and I ought to not be able to say something here, but I think, what is it? Uh, I do think you have to believe in what you're doing, and you have to stay with it. I remember being in London, and I was 17, and all the guys, I, was, I came down with a, a bunch of guys called, we called ourselves the Roadrunners, and then we changed our names to the Wildflowers, because that was cooler, right? And um, they decided they were going to go back home. And I found myself in London, home, jobless, basically, without any connections at all. And I had a uh, 100-watt Selma amp. I had three Shure microphones and a couple of broken-down speakers. And I was out of business, really. So what I did, I, I sat back, and I think what you have to use is your intelligence and your intuition to make it, you know. Um, I said, okay, how do I get back into business? I sold two of the microphones and kept one. I sold the 100 watt amp and I bought a 50 watt system. So I had one mic and a 50 watt system and I was back in business. I got the Melody Maker, which is a, a I think it's still going. It was in the, uh, and they had in the back of the, um, of the Melody Maker, they had uh, you know singer looking for job, band looking for singer, you know. And I found a band looking for a singer. I called them up and joined a band and got back into business. And the thing to do is to stay out there, to stay on the scene, as it were. Um, because as a result of that, I was playing with, and I gave them the name The Brown Sugar, and we were playing in a blues club together, and we were playing blues, when Paul Kossoff came up and asked if he would like, if he could come up and have a jam. And that's how Free was born. So, you know, you stay with it. Uh, however you can, I think that's, that's the thing to remember. To some people in the room, this, this question might sound a little nuts, but bear with me, it comes with a backstory. The story of how you formed Led Zeppelin, so to speak. <laughs> tell, us, tell us this. Without me? No. <laughs> I, actually, I was touring with Free, and we were touring uh, England with a, a jazz player called Alexis Corner, who was kind of our mentor. And he was also... He knew Robert Plant, and we played in Birmingham. This was before Led Zeppelin. And um, we played at the Railway Tavern, which is a club under this Railway Arches. The Railway Arches, they were called. And, um, and Robert got up to jam with Alexis Corner. And in those days, I mean, Robert was full on. I mean, he was, he was Led Zeppelin without the band behind him. He had the hair, the jeans, the whole thing, you know. And he was amazing. Um, and so we got to talking. He came back to the hotel with us for a cup of tea. And uh, he says, um, I've, I, I've been contacted by this guy called Jimmy Page. Have you heard of him? I said, yeah, yeah, yeah. He's a session guy down in London. Everybody's talking about him, you know. He was on the Kinks record and all this kind of thing. And uh, he said, yeah, they've offered me a job with, with this band, with Peter Grant managing them. I said, oh, yeah. He said, well, they, they've offered me 30 quid a week or a percentage. And I said, really? Take the percentage, you know? And it was years later when Peter Grant had been through free and everything. Then I, now I, Peter Grant is managing me, and I'm sitting in Peter Grant's huge mansion. It's this amazing castle with the moat around it and security everywhere and everything. And, and I told him this story, you know? And I said... And I, when I got to the line, I said, you know, take the percentage. He looked at me and he goes, oh, that was you, was it? <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> and it was funny, I, I, I reminded Robert of this when I saw him last time. And he said, yeah, I remember that, yeah. Did he give you 10%? Uh, you know what, I should have said, a finder's fee, hey. <laughs> uh, Peter Grant, uh, in the room, you probably have heard that name before, one of the most legendary band managers oh, ever yeah. in the movie The Song Remains the Same. He is such a powerful individual. And, of course, he managed you, and you shared not only a manager with Zeppelin, but a, a record label in, in that you recorded Bad Company Records with Swan Song. Yeah. Tell me something about Peter Grant that we might not have heard before, something that made him such a legendary manager to you. Well, there's so many stories about Peter Grant. I mean, he was a giant. He was a huge guy, an ex-wrestler. And he was a very intelligent man. And he, was, he had something of a reputation as, as a gangster, I suppose, really, you know. 
And maybe there was something to that, I don't know. You know, he was always great with us. He was always very protective and very, very smart with the contracts and everything. But uh, I remember, uh, 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 what was it, Simon, Simon Kirk had a word with him about, you know, Paul thinks you're, you might be a bit of a gangster or something like that. So I went in one day and Peter Grant was standing in the office and he had like a fedora on and a tie and he had a Tommy gun in his hand like, he was, I went, what? And he said, go, go, go behind the door. And then uh, Simon walked in and he, he, he goes, hello, Simon. Here you are then. And si- Simon just f- threw out the door, you know, because it was, it was true, apparently. But it was a Tommy gun. It was so old-fashioned. It was like the old, uh, you know, the 30s Tommy gun, which I don't think gangsters even use anymore. But it was one of them things. I think, and you could probably correct me if I'm wrong, in the, in the movie, the song remains the same. I think he, yeah, he pulled out that Did he song pull again. that? Yeah. Maybe it was a proper use from time to time. Maybe he was rehearsing a prop. Yeah, I'll hang on yeah. to that gun. It might come in handy. Yeah. Well, he did have a way. He could intimidate people. And, uh, yeah, no problem. Just by size alone. But that was the, those days. Things have changed now, I think. It's more business now, isn't it? True enough. It was the Wild West then, a little bit. Uh, Midnight Moonlight is one of those songs that I always have in my mind when I think of you. When you, when you got into the firm with, with, with Jimmy Page years thereafter, what was most appealing about being in a band with Jimmy? Well, yeah. Uh, Jimmy's a great guy. You know, we still see each other. I, I still see him when I, he always comes to the shows. He was at Wembley when we played there with Bad Company. He was at the Albert Hall when I played there with my solo band. He was even at the table when I, um, I received a songwriting award in... Um, yeah, he's always there. He's great, you know. But at that time, Led Zeppelin had, because of the very sad demise of, uh, of John Bonham, you know, which was a terrible, terrible thing. It, it really knocked them all for six. And the, the band just stopped working. Led Zeppelin stopped working. And I pulled out of Bad Company at that time because as well as other things, I just thought, wow, it's all too crazy for me. You know, I want to just... Uh, get off the road and I build a studio in my house and I thought I know what I'll do I'll stay home and I'll make music in my little house like this so I was doing this making music in the studio and Jimmy started to pop around just to see what I was doing and um, one thing led to another he he brought some music along um, and said do you think you could write some lyrics for this and it was about 20 minutes piece of music it was incredible but it was really too long for me so I had to I cut it back all the way to about 11 minutes, I think, in the end. Um, and that became the first song we wrote together. It was called Midnight Moonlight Lady. And I think, I think as with every band, the lifeblood of the band is, are, is, are the songs. Um, that, that's really where it starts. You know, I've, I've found that. You know, I, when I formed Free with Paul Kossoff, we started to write songs, first of all, you know. Um, and with Bad Company... I, Mick Ralphs and I started to write songs together. So with Jimmy, that's what happened again. And then we got a call from uh, the Arms for the from the Arms tour. That's right. And they asked us, "Can you? We heard you're in the studio. I don't know how they heard we were in the studio because it wasn't even official or anything. But can you put a band together for the Arms tour?" And uh, and we said, "Well, we've we've only got 15 minutes, maybe 20 minutes of music." They said, "Oh, that's fine. That's all you need." So we we ran out of excuses not to go, and we we put it together, and we went out. So that was actually, even though we weren't called a firm, that was the first uh, firm dates. And um, Jimmy was very very keen to get back out on the road, and I was less keen. You know, I, I said, "Ah, oh, I don't really want to do the whole grinding touring again." You know. Uh, because I'm sure a lot of people know it is pretty grinding on the road, you know. Um, and you have to be loving what you're doing on stage to make the travel worthwhile and all that. So, um, but, so what we did is we made a deal. He said, I'll tell you what we'll do. We'll make two albums and we'll tour them and that's all we'll do. And I said, okay, we'll do that. So I committed to two years with him and, and, and we didn't even have a contract between us. It was just a handshake and that's what we did. Yeah. You mentioned Mick Ralphs, and, and, and for those in the room that may or may not know Mick Ralphs, who's in Mott the Hoople, and uh, they had all the young dudes, and they became a success thanks to David Bowie supplying that song. Um, Mick also wrote, and he sang it on a Mott the Hoople record, one of the greatest songs the Bad Company did. Um, and it's one of those songs that, had you not been around to sing it, we never would have heard. 
because his vocal wasn't as strong. He was a guitar player more than a vocalist. Ready for love. Oh, yeah. yeah. If you've never heard the version with, it's good to kind of A, B it, listen to it, and then listen to the version you created. Yeah. What did you think of when you heard that song? Did you get to hear the record with him doing it first? Um, well, we were, uh, we were touring together, actually. Mott the Hoople, I had a band called Peace right after Free, and it was just a three-piece uh, band. And we were touring together, and, and Mick and I would gravitate. In, in, there was a band room where you tune, we all tuned up, you know. <laughs> so it was in those days. So we tuned up, and we would just gravitate together, and he'd play me songs, and I'd play him ideas. Oh, I've got this one, you know. And he played me Can't Get Enough of Love, first of all. And I said, wow, that's fantastic. Why are you guys not doing that song? And he goes, oh, it's not really Mott the Hoople's style, you know. And I said, well, it's my style. I'll sing it, you know, give it to me. So he said, oh, okay, you know. And then I played him rock steady, and we, we, we exchanged songs of various, like, like things. Um, Ready for Love, you, may, you would think it was, was not really in the mix until I think I heard it, I can't remember, actually, when I, when I first heard that. But I knew straight away it was a great song. It's one of his best songs, I think, that. Uh, it was fantastic from yeah. that first record. Again, we're going to get to uh, two live tracks in about 10 or 15 minutes. For many of us, it was a welcome day when uh, the Eagles got a new member in the middle of the 1970s named Joe Walsh. And it turns out you had a role, as I understand it, and Joe becoming an Eagle. Yeah, <laughs> well, I did really. We were, uh, we, Bad Company were at, um, we were staying out in a place called Malibu uh, in, um, what is it, LA? The, the slums LA. of Malibu? Yeah, the slums of Malibu, yeah, fly me. We were actually doing very well then, so we each had an apartment there, and Boz had a big party at his house, so we all went down there. Houses on the beach, it was very nice. And um, uh, Joel was there, and he was a solo artist at that time. So we got talking at the party, and he said, uh, hey, I'm, I've been offered a, 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 you know, like a gig or a, something with a, these bunch of guys called the Eagles. You know, have you heard of them? I said, yeah, yeah, I've heard of them. Because they weren't that big at the time, you know. Um, and uh, he, says, he says, but I, I'm done with the business. I want to go and, and just hide away in the hills, you know. Um, because uh, my brain hurts, I think he said. And uh, uh, what do you think? And I said, well, uh, well you know what? When I, when I left free, I did find that although you're hugely successful and you kind of think the music business revolves around you you'll find that it doesn't when you step away they just everything just goes right on without you you know it's the way it is why don't you go and do a rehearsal with them and then go disappear into the woods and the next thing i heard was hotel california so so that you know they obviously made a connection yeah. Love Joe. Your wife does the best impersonations of Joe, too. Oh, my. Joe Cynthia, isms. Cynthia does the best impersonations yeah. of Joe. Yeah. Well, we did some demos together, and uh, he came up to, my, up to here, and he was like, and we're listening to the thing, and he goes, Hey, Paul, is it a little fast, or am, am I just listening too quickly? So, <laughs> Yeah. When it comes to live gigs, it doesn't get much bigger than 350,000 fans in the Ukraine for that benefit you did for AIDS with, with Queen. What a powerful equation. You, Queen, 350,000 fans for a benefit. Talk a bit about, if you would, for us, your affinity for Queen and your connection to their music. Yeah, well, it was one of those things that came together. I, uh, throughout my life, I, I always go for... Uh, the next thing that I do is going to be something that feels right, you know? And it, I must say, if someone had called up and said, hey, man, do you fancy being the singer of Queen? I would have went, well, I don't know if I can do that, you know? But we actually, we did a show together. I, um, there was a show for um, celebrating Island Records, and Chris Blackwell, who's the head of Island Records, asked me to close the show with All Right Now because it was appropriate, you know, we were on that label. And Queen were playing uh, too, and Brian said to me, look, I'll tell you what, we want to play live, and you want to play live, so I'll make a deal with you. Um, we'll be your backing band for all right now if you'll be our singer for We Will Rock You and We Are The Champions. And I said, hmm, sounds like a good deal. You know, this I can handle, because those, those songs are sort of in the ballpark of where I am, where I'm at, I suppose, you know. 
And uh, we did that. It was so exciting that we said, we all came off stage, you know, full of it and said, well, let's do some more. We'll definitely do some more. Now, I've often jammed with bands and we've said, come off stage doing that. And it's really, you know, we get too busy. It doesn't happen. But a couple of days later, Brian called up and said, how do you fancy doing some shows in Europe just for fun as Queen and Paul Rogers? And I, and I thought, well, you know, it did work that. So, so we said, so I said, yeah, let's do that. And the thing escalated from that. And, and that's how that evolved, really. Yeah. Other bands then that you, is it true? Let's play true or false. Uh, bands that you could have sung with that they had interest in you and you, you for whatever reason, didn't. Deep Purple? Yeah, yeah, they did, actually. A, a couple of bands asked me to, uh, to, to come sing with them. Um, Deep Purple was one. I was forming Bad Company at the time, so it wasn't possible. But they're a great band. Journey? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Neil Sean, when he was forming Journey, sent me... Again, I was still I was forming Bad Company. I think uh, what had happened was that people had, had heard that I'd left free, and so, oh, let's, we can ask, you know, if he wants to sing with us. So there was quite a few people, and um, that was the before Journey even began. Hmm. Yeah, they were a really guitar band. They were a far different band in those days, weren't they? I mean, pre sort of Steve Perry finding his oh, commercial Steve Perry way. Was, uh, was a gr- is a great singer, no doubt clearly, about it. Clearly, you know, clearly. and they get, made a good choice there. But it, that was it. Was wasn't even it didn't even exist at that time. It was a plan, you know. Yeah. And and one that surprised uh, a lot of people. And tell us a bit about it. That you could have been a member of the Doors. Well, at the same time, again, I mean, and I didn't know this. At the time, I found out years later when I played with um, a new version of The Doors and they had a different singer and, and Robbie Krieger came up to me and he says, I've been meaning to talk to you because way back in the 70s, after Jim had died, we were at a loss and we came over, to, oh, the whole band got on an airplane, we went to England and we looked for you. We couldn't find you because we wanted you to be the singer. And I was like, wow, really? I couldn't believe that. It was quite amazing. But, um, you know. Four years ago in London, you performed at Nelson Mandela's 90th birthday bash, which must have been an honor. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. On that bill, uh, one artist uh, who uh, a lot of people had a great affinity for, who's no longer with us. What are your impressions of uh, the great, the late great Amy Winehouse? Well, you know, again, talk about a shooting star. That, that right there, she, she had it. She totally had the voice. She was absolutely fantastic, in, in my estimation. She was a great singer. And uh, we've lost, again, someone that could have really mellowed into a really great artist. And uh, it, it's a terrible shame that we lost her. Yeah, yeah. There's a quote from a recent review from one of your shows. I think it was uh, last Sunday in Victoria you played. And somebody writes, Paul Rogers is the perfect advertisement for healthy living, a walking, talking example of how taking care of oneself can pay off. He also called you, he also called you deafening, deafeningly loud, which which is a compliment really where we come from. Oh, how have you not gone deaf yet? And how do you stay so rock strong? Pardon? No, I'm just kidding. Yeah, yeah. Huh? Uh, you know, I, I mean, I, we talked about drugs and all that kind of stuff early, earlier. And a long time ago, I decided it, I got to live clean. If I want to be doing this, you know, for a, a lot of years, the real buzz for me is music. It's being on stage, making that connection with the audience, having the audience sing your songs, you know, and everybody going to a higher place. It feels like that. You know, you go to a, 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 a new world, really. You create a, a, a different world. And that's really the buzz. And anything that gets in the way of that is, is not going to be helpful. So I decided I was going to live clean, you know, way back 15 years ago. And, and that's what I do. You know, I'm, I eat right and I exercise a little bit. And I'm, it's quite boring, really. But, but, you know, but seriously, though, I mean, it is... Uh, it, uh, the, the buzz for me is is making music, and that's what I want to keep on doing. What's your biggest fear, Paul? My biggest fear is that you know maybe there are too many human beings on the planet, and we're overloading it. I think we have to really readjust our lifestyle to live in the, on the planet as if it is a living being, and uh, uh, and we have to take care of it because we we may well destroy all the th- beautiful things that we've we've developed as uh, as a society, as a civilization. That's what's always bothered me, actually. We might drown in our own rubbish. You know, it's time to 
to clean up our act. You want to? <laughs> that, thank you. Wow. Yes. Thank you. Yes. How would you like to play? You want to play a couple songs? Oh, okay. All right. All right. <laughs> Thanks. Right. How do we do this? Oh, it's it's electrifying. This is great. We didn't actually sound check, so you guys will know what we're going through here a little bit. So I'm on a swingy chair. Right. I'll see if I can do this <laughs> without swinging around too much halfway through it. Here we go. There you go. Let's see what this sounds like. Baby, when I think about you, I think about love, darling, I don't live without you in your life, if I had those golden dreams of my yesterday. If I think about you, I think about love, darling. If I live without you, I live without love. And if I had the sun and moon, and it was shining, you know I would give. Love satisfied. Feel like making. Thank you. You're very kind. Just, just before you do one more for us to wrap this afternoon, um, I want to talk a bit about your future. 
And I want to congratulate you. You touched on it, the uh, Songwriters Award. The, the, was it the Ivor Novello Award? Yeah. Tell, tell me a bit about that award and, and what it meant to you. Well, it's a great honor because uh, it, it is uh, the decision to uh, present that award is, is within the business. So it's all you know, musical people that make the decision. And so it, uh, it, it's a great honor. You know, it's nice. Was it specific to your body of work or was it specific to something? Uh... Yes, it was a songwriting uh, award. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, nice. What, what, was the, <laughs> what was the last... But, but for, yeah, for your whole career, it wasn't specific to a certain song or anything. It was just, you're a great songwriter, here's an award, Paul. It was a songwriting award, yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> tell me this, um, in the next sort of 30 to 60 days, and over the summer I know you have some tour dates planned. What is on the horizon? What are you excited about right now in your career? Well, I'm excited about touring. Uh, I have a great a great solo band. I really love the guys. We've just done three dates in Canada and um, it was really, it was a beautiful atmosphere. Um, doing some dates down in the States. I am looking at doing a, a Stax album, but I'm not supposed to tell you that. But anyway, I do, because I love Stax and I love the blues. Um, I'm going to do something with the Czechoslovakian, um, what are they called? Um, the Bohemian um, Orchestra early next year I'm looking forward to doing that so I'll be I'll be actually singing a couple of songs I mean they've asked me to choose some songs to that I would sing with an orchestra and they could be I mean a, a number of songs come to mind like say maybe maybe that one be my friend or, or be my friend or um um seagull perhaps you know there are some songs that lend themselves to a an orchestra and I look forward to that you want to do that song? As for me, it was the closing track of that first album. I think it's the, the best song ever from your pen, Seagull. Would you play that for oh, us? Oh, thank you. I'll try. <laughs> and let's, let's congratulate Paul and thank him for his uh, intuition and his intellect. Sound and chill to you. What do you I'll do. It's only rock and roll, isn't it? It's good. And 